Good morning. Oh, 
good morning and welcome to Hope Christian Church. Glad you could join us here this morning. We're going to have a time of worship and a time of teaching and we'll share in communion later. And with that in mind, uh, for those of you that are listening to us or watching on uh, Facebook at home, please, uh, if you haven't already gathered together the elements of communion, do that now so you're ready for when we share communion at the end of the message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your great love. We thank you that, that you are available to us, that you have put your spirit in us to, to strengthen and encourage, to guide and direct, to comfort us. Pray, Father, that we will listen to your spirit as you, as you communicate with us various ways, and that we will press into your heart and share in the love that you have for us with others around us. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together this morning and pray for your spirit to, to work in our hearts and our minds this morning as we fellowship together with each other and with you. And we do this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
Amen. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of times that that situations or or people around us or things that we're hearing or reading about seem to make us feel isolated or or um, that uh, that we're inconsequential. And that uh, sometimes it seems like uh, you know everybody's everybody's on your you know, on your case or against you. I think it's really important for us to to remember that having accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross, <clears throat> God's Spirit dwells within us, and that no matter what we're going through or what we're being subjected to, He is for us. He wants to prosper us. He wants what's best for us. He wants what is going to draw us closer to Him and help us to, to live the life that He wants us to live. So when, when we realize that God dwells within us and that He is, he is he's behind us 100%, we need to just take comfort in that and remember that it doesn't matter what's against us if God is on our side. If God is on our side, we won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the skies crumble, there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. If God is on our side, who can be against us? If God is on our side, we won't be afraid. Though the Well, good morning. Welcome to Hope. We are delighted that you're with us today, either here in the room or online. You know, each week, um, our guys back in the soundboard give me an update how many people watch Hope online. And 
quite frankly, we are astounded, we're amazed how many people are joining us online. And that's just really a cool thing. We are so grateful, so, so thankful that we've been able to, uh, during this pandemic, reach out to people and still make church a real thing in your life. I, I just want to talk about that for a second, though, because, you know, two weeks from today is Easter. And I think what a wonderful time to come back to church. You know, for the last two years, we've been encouraging you to do what's right, do what's safe, and, and to stay away. And I think um, doing what's right now could be coming back to church. You know, Scripture says, let us not forsake the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. And I think we're at the point where, you know, we're going back to work, we're going to theaters, we're going to crowds, and um, I think it's time to get back to church. It's tough, you know, when we've kind of for two years created a new habit of staying away, and I think it's time to kind of get back into life fully, and I just want to encourage you to come back. If nobody's invited you to church, this is your personal invitation from me uh, to come back. We're going to um, have just a wonderful uh, Palm Sunday next Sunday, and I have a special message uh, planned and prepared for that. And then Easter Sunday, we've got a great entire service plan, things for the kids, things for each of us, and I uh, just really want to encourage you to make uh, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday both a real priority in your life and invite you to come back. We're um, wrapping up today our study, a uh, several months long study of the prophet Elijah. When I first started this study, I thought, well, this will be a couple of weeks, and I think it's gone about three or four months now, and uh, today will be the last message on Elijah, and we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 2. We're looking at Elijah's departure from earth, and it's just an incredible story, and I'm anxious to share that with you, but before we do, let's, let's stop and pray and ask God to be at work within us and prepare our hearts, because there's some things I want to share with you about your journey today as well, so let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for Elijah, the things that we've learned from him, and, and just the incredible man of God that he is, the things that he has displayed, and really sets a challenge for each and every one of us how to live our lives. And so we're grateful for the time that we've had to study him, to learn from him. But Lord, ultimate, ultimately, we know that you are our teacher. You're the one who helps us to see truth and, and to engraft that, to treasure that within our hearts. And so, Lord, today... I pray that as we look at this final message uh, from this great man, Elijah, that there would be things that we see that are so applicable, so helpful for us in our lives today. So again, thank you for his life, for the opportunity to study, and again, now to be challenged by it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, again, 2 Kings chapter 18, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12 today. And before we get started, I just want to share with you, you know, Georgia and I love going on road trips. We enjoy just kind of packing in, into the car and heading out and just seeing America. We've done that our entire married life. We've traveled uh, many thousands of miles, and oftentimes because with a family with four kids, it was cheaper to drive places than to fly places, but we've just really enjoyed that. So we've kind of made that a practice. Whenever we go somewhere, we always consider driving as an option, and I think in the years that we've been married, we have visited nearly every national park in the western United States. Uh, I bought one of these passes, you know, that seniors can get where you can just flash your pass and you get into a national park for free, well, after you pay the, the admission, you know, for the coupon thing. But we, we just love going there, and that's always kind of a soft spot in, in my heart, going to these national parks. My dad was a, a forest ranger. Um, he was a, a ranger at Sequoia National Park. So I think every time I go to a national park, I get a little misty-eyed, and I think I'm my dad, and, but it's good. And of these trips, we've always realized that, you know, it's the destination that is the goal. And uh, we've been able to see some just wonderful, some amazing, beautiful parts of God's creation, and there have been, in our road trips, hundreds, literally hundreds of hours of conversation that Georgia and I have had, and it's just been so precious. There's also been hundreds of hours of probably where it's just been quiet, where we've kind of talked out or we're tired or maybe one of us is sleeping, but there's still the opportunity just to look out the window and see the beauty of, of creation and, and enjoy that together. Uh, there have been books on tape, then books on CD, then books on audio. We're kind of dating ourselves as we kind of wor work our way through technology. We've even read books to one another as we've traveled. And as we've traveled, there have been some wrong turns, 
But even in those wrong turns, there have been things that we've seen that we never would have seen otherwise that have been just exceptional, been things that we've enjoyed. I wouldn't trade these road trips really for anything. They've been a precious time with my wife earlier on with our kids, and, and I just look forward to those. Well, why do I share with you about road trips? And it's because oftentimes we use this metaphor that life is a journey. And I was thinking about that this week, that life is a journey. And then as I thought about that, I thought about all of these road trips that we've taken, and I realized, you know what, life isn't just one journey. I think life is a culmination of many journeys. And so we've set out, we've gone to different places, and we've come back, and that journey is complete. And then maybe in a year later or in time, we'll go out and we'll take on another journey. Of course, when we talk about life being a journey, we understand that there's a kind of an overarching metaphor that life is that journey that we talk about. But oftentimes, there are smaller journeys that, that we take that kind of help make up this large one. Each one of these small trips, these small journeys that we've taken kind of add to the whole, kind of help to, to develop who we are as people, to appreciate things those hundreds of hours of conversation to appreciate things about each other. Those books that we've listened to on tape have helped to grow us, to mature us, to, to nurture us. Uh, the things that we've seen have always impressed us with God's creation. And so even though there have been many journeys, they all add to the greater journey in life. And for the past couple of months, as I mentioned, we've been looking at the life of Elijah. And today we are going to look at his final steps here on, on earth from 2,500 years ago. But just because we look at the conclusion of this journey does not mean that God is done with Elijah. And when we finish a journey, it doesn't necessarily mean that God's done with us either. As I was thinking about that and thinking about Elijah this last week, I, I know that, and we'll get to it here in just a few moments, where we, we see his, his time on earth has come to an end. And there's a miraculous way that God just brings him home, and I'm excited to share that with you. But even after that, we see Elijah emerge even in the pages of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 17, there is this, this moment when Jesus is preparing for his crucifixion. He's preparing for the culmination of his ministry. And he goes to a quiet place to pray alone. His disciples are a few yards away and, and they're watching, they're observing. And during these moments of quiet, something miraculous happens where Jesus on this mountaintop all of a sudden is joined by two other men. One, the lawgiver Moses and the prophet Elijah. And at this Mount of Transfiguration, God has a way of acknowledging that his son Jesus has completed all that he's given him to do. He has fulfilled the law and the prophets. And so who better to have than the lawgiver and the chief among prophets there with him. And, and they have this opportunity to minister to Jesus as he prepares for the final steps of his life. In Revelation chapter 11, most scholars believe that there are these two witnesses that come from God who proclaim the good news to all the world. And soon, they will have an impact that is greater than probably any man, human man, who's lived before them because of how their voice goes out to the entire world. And I believe technology that has been invented will help to cause for that to happen. And one of those prophets from Revelation chapter 11, we believe, is Elijah. And so God's not done with him by any means. So today, we're going to look at the the finishing of his earthly sojourn, his, this trek that he's had on, on earth, but God's not done with him. And I share that with you because I want you to know God's not done with you either. You may be closing some chapter in your life, and maybe this pandemic has caused you to close some chapters. Maybe there's a job that you had that you love, but you know what? Because of the pandemic, it's done. I was listening to a podcast just this week, and the gentleman who was speaking was saying the number of relationships that have ended during the pandemic is astounding because all of a sudden people had to live together 24-7 and they didn't have that respite of going to work. They didn't have that time away from each other and as they were 
literally kind of hovering on top of one another, they realize this is hard and and relationships have broken up. Maybe that's a chapter that's closed for some of you. There are other chapters that may have closed during this time, and that does not mean that God is finished, that he's done, that he'll no longer choose to use you. God is in the business of using those who will walk with him, who will be his completely and, and work to serve and to further his kingdom. God is still very much in the business of using people, and he wants to use, I believe, each and every one of us. Let me just remind you some of the things that Elijah has gone through in his life. And, and from the time that we were introduced to him in 1 Kings chapter 17 to where we, we conclude his, his earthly sojourn here in 2 Kings chapter 2, about 14 years have elapsed. And so there's been a 14-year study of this man that we have conducted these last few months, and we've seen some amazing things. We saw him confront the most wicked, the most evil man on the face of the earth. And then God sends him to the brook of Cherith, where God does some cutting, some chipping, some chiseling in the life of this man, because there were some things about Elijah that God was not pleased with. And he sends him to the place called the cutting place to do so. And after he does that, he sends him to Zarephath, the polishing place where God smooths out those rough spots that he has chipped and chiseled away at to make Elijah completely the man of full use to him in, in his work. And during that time, he, he stays with this widow in Sidon and, and lives with her for about three years. And incredible, miraculous things happen. The never-ending flour and oil so that they might be sustained and eat. The death of this widow's son and Elijah being used to raise him up to walk again and to live And then shortly after that, we see this encounter between Elijah and the false prophets of Baal and Asheroth at the top of Mount Carmel, where God sends down fire and consumes the altar. And and the people declare today in Israel, God, the Lord, he is God. And shortly after that, we see Elijah meet a young man who will for the next 10 years of his life, 10 years of his life, be his constant companion be his student, his, his disciple, be his dearest friend. That's the man Elisha. And they develop, I believe, a profound friendship, a unique relationship that is so good for both of them, but in a very real sense, and I think this will become evident for us even more so in just a few moments, it's like a father-son relationship. They're both prophets, <laughs> They're both godly men. They are both incredibly, greatly used of God. And now that we come to the point in time where they will part from one another. Listen to me as I read 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, Now it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. They first start their journey in this this land called Gilgal. And Gilgal is important to the people of Israel. The word Gilgal literally means a rolling place, but it has to do with a rolling over of things in your life, a transition point. It's where God changes things. And so we see God changing whom he will use. He will move from Elijah to Elisha. And so it's it's very interesting. It's symbolic in, in many ways that they start this departure in Gilgal. Gilgal happens to be the place where the first Passover for Israel took place once they entered into the promised land. And so it's always been a place very special to the people of Israel. It's where new starts, where new beginnings take place. And so we see this take place where the two of them are in Gilgal together. And then in verse 2, it says, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. For the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you and your soul live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. Both of them are prophets. (laughs) They know exactly what is about to take place. They know that this 10-year friendship, they know that this transition from one man to the other is about to take place. But the fellowship, the, the closeness that these men have is so close, it's so precious. They They just don't want to leave each other. And so when Elijah encourages Elisha to stay, Elisha says, no, as long as you're here, I'm with you. And so they say they're going to go on to 
Bethel. The word Bethel means house of God. I believe that Elijah wanted Elisha to stay there because he knew that within the house of God, there would be comfort for his heart, for his soul. Those of you that have suffered loss, you've maybe had a a loved one that's been taken, that's passed on. You know the grief that you bear, the sorrow, the, the heaviness of heart. And you need friends, you need family to rally around, to gather, to be able to minister to you, to care for you. And I think in Elijah's heart of compassion for Elisha, he says, stay at the house of God, where you'll be ministered to, where you will be cared for. I know in my life, it has been the house of God that has ministered to me. I remember standing in church, literally just days after my dad passed away, standing in worship with tears running down my face, and the pastor making eye contact with me, and then coming up after the song that we sang, and he said, I know some of you are hurting today. Some of you are grieving. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord. There were literally a thousand people in the room, and I know he was speaking to me that day. There's something about being in the house of the Lord when we need to be cared for, when we need to be comforted. Several years ago, George's dad passed away. It happened to be during a time when I was not working at a church. And I thought, what a great opportunity every Sunday to go to a different church. There are different pastors around that I wanted to hear. There were different ministries I wanted to see. And so I was thinking, you know, until I get back on staff at a church, I'm just going to, every Sunday, we're going to go visit a church. And we were doing that. And Kevin was having fun. And George's dad passed away. The next Sunday, I said, where shall we go to church this week? And she was very clear about, I'm grieving. I'm hurting. I need a place that's home. And I had to realize that for the next few months, however long it would be, we needed to plug in and find a place that would be home. And so we found a church, a church that ministered to our heart, to our soul, greatly. We needed the house of God when we were at a point in our life when we were desperate for fellowship, desperate for comfort. And that's one reason why I want to encourage the folks that have been staying away to come back. We need one another. And so that time at Bethel was because of Elijah's concern and his understanding for what Elisha would go through. And when they get to Bethel, it says, Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? He said, Yeah, I I know. Isn't it interesting, there were prophets there that knew exactly what was going to take place, and there were these two prophets who are the center of our story, and all of them know exactly what's going to happen that day. I was thinking this morning, do prophets even need to have a conversation? Do they just think it, and the other guy goes, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But they came to Elisha, and they said, don't you know that your master's going to be taken from you today? And he says, I, I know. And he asks them, would you keep silent? I think a word of that just was hard to hear. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here if it pleases the Lord. For the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as the soul lives within you, I will not leave. So they went to Jericho. Jericho happens to be the oldest city in the world. The oldest continuously populated city in the history of the world. At this point in time, it's a blustering, it's a large, it's a huge city. The name Jericho means a fragrant place, a sweet aroma. And I think that Elijah knew that there was going to be grief in the heart of Elisha. And so he wanted to send him to a place where there would be the sweet aroma. You know, scripture talks about our prayer being a sweet aroma before God. And I think he knew that Elisha would be in prayer. He would be a man in grief. And what better place than there to have the Lord minister to him? But then Elijah said, stay here. He said, as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, I will not leave. So the two of them went on. 
And the two and the fifty men and the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance where the two of them stood, and then they went out to face the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, he rolled it up, his shawl, if you will, and struck the water, and it was divided so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what you will, and it will be done for you. God sends the two of them now to Jordan. Jordan's an interesting place for them to go. The name Jordan means to flow down. As the Jordan River begins up in the Tel Dan region of Israel, it flows with the gravity flow all the way down to the Dead Sea. Through Galilee, it continues after Galilee, then on to the Dead Sea, and it continues to flow down. But very soon, in this life between Elijah and Elisha, there's going to be something that flows down from Elijah to Elisha. And again, God, in his beauty, sends these men to a place where something very unique, very special, is going to take place. And so it was, they crossed over, and Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I may do for you before I'm taken away from you. And Elisha said, please, let me have a double portion of your spirit to fall upon me. A few minutes ago, I was trying to help you to understand and appreciate the relationship that these two men have. It was certainly teacher to student, mentor to mentee. It was a discipling type of relationship, but it was a love relationship. It was a wholesome relationship. But again, I I submit to you, it was more like a father-son relationship. Because you see, we're at the end of Elijah's life. And it's at the end of a man's life that it's appropriate for him then to dole out his inheritance to his family. And when Elisha says, I want a double portion, those of you that have been with us before, we've talked about this before. The oldest son in a family gets a double portion. When we study about Isaac and Esau, when we study about people in Scripture that receive these, these inheritance, we know that the oldest son gets a double portion. So when Elisha asks for a double portion, in essence, he's saying, you're my father. You have been my spiritual father. You have been my protector. You have been my mentor. There's a relationship that is so very precious to me. And to demonstrate that, he says, I want a double portion of your spirit to fall upon me. Really, the only thing that Elijah has to give. I think what a beautiful relationship. What a, just an amazing thing these two men share together. And so he says, Elijah does to his, his young son, he says, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, when you see me, when I am taken from you, it shall, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it will not be so. Then it happened as they continued and talked, and suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire And separated the two of them. And Elijah went and stood in this whirlwind and was caught up into heaven itself. And Elisha saw and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them into pieces as a sign of his own mourning and grief. I was talking with a a friend this week. They said, Kevin, what are you preaching on this Sunday? I said, oh, I'm going to talk about the chariot of fire. And this friend of mine who does not go to church said, you're going to talk about the movie? (laughs) The one about Eric Little, the Olympic runner, and how... I said, no, 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 it's it's from the Bible. And this friend of mine, his face just kind of changed. He said, the chariot of fire is in the Bible? And I go, yeah, there's some good stuff in there. This chariot of fire comes down. Elijah steps in and is whisked away into heaven. Elijah is one of two men that we know of in the history of the world, two human men who does not meet physical death. Elijah is caught up in this chariot of fire. He is swooped away and 
and carried into God's presence. The other, in the book of Genesis, it tells us about a godly man, a man who walked with God, and the relationship was so sweet, so dear, that I think God just said, you know what, Enoch, <laughs> it's just, why don't you just come on up? And in the book of Genesis, we see, in essence, an Old Testament rapture of Enoch. So Enoch and Elijah are two men who never face physical death. Now, I believe, personally, God has some things for these two men yet to come. This chariot of fire is an amazing way that God rescues and spares Elijah from physical death. As I mentioned, I believe he will come back in Revelation chapter 11. And in Revelation chapter 11, Elijah, this great witness of God, this great prophet of God, is killed. And scripture is faithful to its word, appointed unto each man is a time to die. And Elijah will die someday. But he is a man who is even now being prepared by God for this great, important task that is set before him. There was a journey that he had some 2,500 years ago, and there are journeys, Mount of Transfiguration, that's already taken place, Revelation chapter 11, yet to take place, that he will engage in. And as I thought about this, I thought, you know, there are some journeys that are of our choosing. When George and I decide to go on a road trip, we have an end point in mind. Usually it's to visit family or someone that we want to go spend some time with. And as we plot our course, I get my maps out and I think, what national parks can we go to? And so there are some journeys that we plan. There are some journeys in life that maybe we don't plan, but they're required of us. Some of you have gone through journeys that you never would have chosen, but it's where you find yourself. And what do we do with that? We, I believe, have an understanding that God is with us every step of the way. Because, you know, some, some journeys are easy and some are difficult. So regardless of the journey that we're on, regardless of the steps, there are things that we do to better prepare ourselves for that journey. And, you know, oftentimes in a journey set before us, the hardest step is the first step. And we need to, I believe, purpose in our heart that when we commence this journey, we will go with God and we will go in a way that will honor and serve him fully. Joshua had a decision to make. He saw the people of Israel falling away. He saw them turning to false gods, to false idols. And he looks to the people and he says, if serving the Lord seems hard, then choose who you're going to serve today. And then he goes in and says, you can... You can worship your ancestors. You can worship false gods. You can worship idols. But then he says, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I think we can purpose in our heart the course of our life, even when some of these journeys that we're on take detours, when they have unexpected switchbacks, when they have courses that maybe we're not planning on, we can still serve the Lord in every step that we take. Colossians 3, verse 17 says, Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to him through God our Father. And so in the journey of life, in the journeys that we set before us, maybe it's your career path, maybe it's your parenting, maybe it's your relationship. There are different journeys, I mentioned, that we're all on. And in each and every one of these, we can purpose to serve God and to do so in a way that will please him and honor him. And so as we begin the journey, there will be, I think, some difficulties. There's going to be some roadblocks, certainly, uh, detours. But we must have faith in the journey. God's called us to be people of faith. And so in these journeys that we undertake, he expects that to be something, I think, that, that nurtures our faith, develops our faith, allows us to demonstrate our faith. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 18, it says, excuse me, yeah, it, it says, the Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. A promise right out of Deuteronomy. 
That's also in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. God will never leave you, never forsake you. And sometimes the journey, the road that we're on is hard. It, it seems difficult. I think corporately, for all of us, the last two years have been a difficult journey. I, I think there have been some steps that we had to take that we probably never would have chosen. And this pandemic and all of the things that result because of that, a lot of it's been very hard. And yet God has asked us to be faithful in all that we do, to journey with him, because he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. And that's why the promise of 2 Chronicles 15, 7, where he says, as for you, people of God, as for you, household of faith, as for you, Hope Church, <laughs> be strong. Do not give up. Your faithfulness and your work will be rewarded. And God wants to use us. He wants to bless us. He wants our effort, our endeavors to be of, of such importance to the kingdom that there will be a reward that awaits us. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, it says, The Lord, he is faithful. He will establish you. He will keep you from destruction. He'll keep you from harm. And so, yeah, you know what? Sometimes the journey is hard. The journey is difficult. It's not a journey that we would have chosen. I would never choose to go through that, but, but here I am. And God is faithful. He will sustain us. He will endure us, give us endurance for every step that we take. And in this journey, God develops us. Again, I believe he grooms us. He matures us. And he wants us to be people who grow in our faith because of the journey. Now, certainly, we want to have faith at the beginning. When we commence the journey, oftentimes, we take that first step of faith. But as we go, he wants to grow us, to nurture us, to help us to be people of even greater faith. I submit to you the great chapter in, in Scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, this hall of fame of, of people of faith. And if you begin in chapter 11, verse 1 of the book of Hebrews and go through the entire chapter, there's just a litany, a, a list of people that demonstrated great faith. And the thing I want you to notice, I, I want to encourage you, maybe in your afternoon time, during a quiet time today, just read this, this one chapter. It'll take you maybe 90 seconds. But the thing that you will walk away with is that all of these people that are, are a lot lauded or commended for being people of great faith, ascribed to, to each and every one of them is an action that demonstrates their faith. It doesn't say, by faith, Kevin sat and waited. <laughs> by faith, he contemplated. But if you read Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah built the ark. A task that took him 120 years. And there are some scholars who say because of the climate of the world at that time, it had never rained prior to that. And here, Noah is preparing an ark for a great flood when the people said, that's crazy. But it takes faith. By faith, Abraham left the city of his father and went to a land that God would show him that he knew not. And so that was literally a journey of faith as he took each step to, to go to a place. He didn't even know what the destination was. By faith, Moses led the people of Israel out of bondage. By faith, Rahab hid the spies at jeopardy of her own life. So again, faith requires some action. That's why James tells us faith without works is dead. You need to demonstrate your faith. You need to engage in life. You don't just sit back and wait for life to happen. You engage fully. And in some ways, we've kind of been in the starting blocks for the last two years, waiting for the gun to go off. And I think the gun's going off now. Now, again, I'm not a prophet, but I see a congregation without masks today. George and I went to a place that we'd gone to for the last two years, and when we pulled up, we thought, they're closed. Because for the last two years, every time we pulled up, there was a line of people outside the door because you couldn't go in. 
And we pulled up, and I thought, oh, they're closed. And I thought, I'm going to walk up and see if there's a sign on the door. I'm going to walk up and see if they've changed their hours. I walked up, and people are inside. <laughs> First time in two years, I think we're seeing doors open. I think we're seeing our world change. I, I think we've been in the starting block for two years, and I think the gun is going off. And we can't just sit back and wait. I, I think we need to engage in life. And I know as a church, we must engage. There are people within the shout of our voice that are on their way to hell. And if they don't hear the good news from us, where will they hear it? We must, too, be people of action. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it says, those who have been given trust must prove themselves faithful. And I don't know about you, but I want to prove myself faithful. I don't want to stand before him one day and have him say, well, you know, Kev, I had a lot of things I really wanted you to do, but you weren't listening. You were so complacent. You were so comfortable. I don't know if that's how God's going to speak, but... I don't want to hear that. I want, him to, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so like Elijah, one day our journey will be complete. And I can't promise you that there's going to be a flaming chariot to pick you up and whisk you away. But I can promise you that one day you'll stand before the Father. And you'll hear from him, you know, I had so much for you to do. Or you'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That was the message Paul had when he spoke to his son in the faith. The Paul-Timothy relationship is so much like the Elijah-Elisha relationship. And so as Paul knows that his life is soon to be done, he will soon be executed by Rome, he writes to his son in the faith and he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which is from the Lord of righteousness himself, and he will be the one who will present it to me. But not only to me, but also to those who long for his coming. Those who, with great expectation, anticipation in their heart, look forward to Jesus. I love Elijah. I've said before, and without a doubt, he is my favorite Old Testament character. For years, I knew I was going to preach on him here at Hope. I, I just didn't know when. And I talked to Ray a couple of months ago, and I said, you know, we just haven't done much in the Old Testament. And I said, I really want to do some teaching on Elijah. And if you know Ray, you know his admonition. He said, go for it. And I love that. I love this book. I love how it speaks to our heart. And many people would look and say, Elijah, he lived 2,500 years ago. What can he teach me? I feel like in the last several months, I have learned so much about me from studying this man, Elijah. And I pray and I trust that you have as well. I'm thankful for these months that we've had to look at the life of Elijah. And so God, thank you for this man. We thank you for his faith. We thank you that he was a man who was completely yours. And when he was whisked up in that chariot of fire, he had the opportunity to stand in your very presence. And he may have heard something like, well done, good and faithful servant, but I'm not done with you yet. And some of us may feel today that we're kind of closing chapters of our life. We may feel that there are pages that have been written and no more is to be written out. But God, you're not done with us either. There are people in our world, people in our lives, people that only we can touch that desperately need to hear the good news. There are things that we can do as far as service, as far as ministry. And God, you choose to use us. And so I pray that as this pandemic, as this time of waiting, as this time of pause comes to an end, that we would realize that there is great work still yet to be done and that you will find us your faithful servants. Lord, thanks again for Elijah, for his example. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In Deuteronomy 31, and then again in Hebrews 13, it says that God has promised never to leave you 
never to forsake you. But he asked, has asked us to remember him. When I was talking with this friend of mine about the chariot of fire, we started talking about church. And he asked me, what is your church service like? And I told him, oh, we sing together, we worship. There's usually a teaching time, me or someone else. And, and then there's more singing, more worship. And I said, oh, but we also take communion. He said, you do that every week? I go, yeah, we do it every week. He goes, does the Bible say you have to? And I said, no, we want to. As a matter of fact, the Bible just says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. As often could be once in your life. Well, I don't think that would be enough. As often could be daily. And there may be some of us that need that reminder daily. So we choose to do it every week at Hope. Not because we have to, but we, we want to. Because we need that reminder that there has been one who loved us so that he willingly gave his life for us. Isn't that something worth being reminded of? And so we choose to celebrate Jesus, his completed work on Calvary's cross, by being obedient to his instructions at his invitation to remember the great price that has been paid for us. And so we hold in our hand a small piece of bread. It reminds us of his broken body, it says, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, each of you, for this is my body broken for you. So as you partake, remember the broken body of Jesus, broken for the remission of your sin. God bless you as you partake. And then scripture says, then he took the cup. And after giving a blessing, he offered it to his disciples. And he said, take and drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of my covenant poured out for you for the remission of sin. And so as we partake of this cup, it reminds us of the shed blood of Jesus poured out that our sin would be covered, that we would be acceptable in his sight. And so God bless you as you partake now of the cup that reminds us of his shed blood. And Lord, we thank you that we have these things to remind us of how much you love us, of how much you have given for us. And so we celebrate Jesus today, his completed work on Calvary's cross. And we're so very grateful that today we are reminded that there is one who loves us so. And all he asks is that we remember him, that we walk with him, that we receive from him. And Lord, today we choose to serve him as well because of this great love. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
thank you. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you guide and direct us. We pray, Father, that we will listen to you and take the lead that you've set for us and share with others around us the love that you have. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at his right hand stands one who is my Savior. I take him at his word and be. Christ died to save me this And in my heart I find a need For Him to be my Savior That He would leave His place on high And come for sinful men to die You found it strange so
Savior loves my Savior lives. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. For those of you that came out and braved this terrible weather we're having today <laughs> to come here, we thank you. Uh, for those of you that are at home, we look forward to the time when you feel comfortable to come back here and join us in person. A few announcements before we go. Uh, men's and women's Bible studies uh, Wednesday night uh, on Zoom. Uh, the uh, Zoom address and password information is available at the church website at hopesearch.org, and they're uh, open to anyone who cares to join those. Uh, this Thursday night, 7 o'clock, drum roll please. There we go, thank you. We will have the last Zoom session on parables with uh, Thursday night. Uh, it's been a, how long has that session gone now? 13 weeks of looking at the parables of Jesus Christ. It's been an amazing uh, run, and uh, Thursday night's the last time, last night, so that uh, Zoom class information also is available on the website, again, at hopesearch.org. Um, this Saturday coming up, uh, the 8th, is it 8th, 9th, I don't have a calendar in my head anymore. Uh, Saturday the 9th, we are having our uh, spring clean work day here at the church, and that's going to be from 8 to 12, and anybody who has... Um, the time available is welcome to come and join. Whether you have skills in your opinion or not, you can be used. Um, and so we look forward to seeing all of you here, as many as you can, you can make it. From 8 to 12, we'll spruce the property up, uh, do some yard work and some cleaning work, and, and prepare for Easter Sunday. And hopefully we'll uh, take some of that uh, direction of the Spirit and invite someone to come to Easter Sunday. That's a, that's a challenge I'm sure that Kevin's going to be issuing next Sunday, but I'll jump the gun here and issue that challenge right now. Start praying about someone that you would like to, to uh, invite to come to Easter service. Um, there's a, a statistic that Kevin has quoted many times. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the, the actual st statistic, but there's a large number of people who haven't come to church because nobody's invited them. And so this would be a great opportunity to invite someone in your life to come and just just share in the fellowship on Christmas on Christmas on Easter morning. It feels like Christmas every day. Anyway, God bless you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. And don't forget to mark it on your calendar for next Saturday from eight to twelve for the church work day. Thanks a lot. God bless. Well,